So what we're going to be looking at now is the idea of magnetic flux and what that is. And this is really quite central to our idea with regards to magnetic fields. So magnetic flux is this represented by this letter phi. And basically, it's an idea of the, if you like, amount of the magnetic field. So you might recall that basically when we did magnetic fields before, we had, for example, a magnet. And we basically drew these magnetic field lines. That looks something like this. And we basically then went, went from north to south along those lines. And we said that, well, somewhere like here was relatively weak. And somewhere here was relatively strong. And we said that because basically it's a strong magnetic field because we said the field lines were close together. Or if you like, the magnetic flux, if you like, is dense. And in this case, you have the field lines are far apart. So basically what we're saying that because these lines are far, like close together over here and far apart over here, the closeness of the field lines indicates the strength, if you like, of the magnetic field. At least that's the term we're using. So if you understand the difference between strength of magnetic field, then the concept we're going to talk about represented by B, which is magnetic flux density, then don't worry about the technical differences there. But we're going to treat those two things at the same, as the same. We're basically saying that the strength of the magnetic field is the magnetic flux density. And that's what we call B. So in other words, how close the field lines are diagrammatically, we now want to represent that mathematically to get B. So if B is the idea of magnetic flux density, how closely they are together, we're basically going to be taking the magnetic flux, which really is the magnetic field lines. And dividing it by the area that it's spread over. So in other words, we end up with a scenario that B must equal phi over A, where B is the magnetic flux density. Phi represents the magnetic flux. And basically, that's a magnetic field line. So if you think of every single line as one unit of flux, then the more lines, then the more magnetic flux. And obviously, the bigger your area, you're probably going to get more magnetic flux because you've just got more to get through. So it's really about how many lines in a particular area. So the A here is standing for area. Area, as you know, is typically measured in square meters. Magnetic flux is given the unit Weber. And so the unit of magnetic flux density will then be Weber per square meter, which is basically Weber per square meter. And this is then abbreviated into Tesla. So what you need to therefore know basically is that B, which formally stands for magnetic flux density, and otherwise known as magnetic field strength for our purposes, is just equal to phi over A, 
And we can, of course, rearrange this to also get phi must equal b times a. So those are the new formulas you'll need to know, and you need to be very familiar with this for the purposes of electromagnetic induction, which we'll be looking at very shortly. Now, we can just also complicate this a little bit in the sense that phi is equal to b times a only if they're perpendicular to each other. So we'll just give you a more complicated example, and we'll give you a simple and a complicated example. So here's a simple example. Imagine that your B is into the page. And I'm going to just give that a unit of two Tesla. So my magnetic field is two Tesla. And I'm going to, let's say, have a shape. And let's say it's a rectangle. And I'm going to make it a pretty big rectangle. So if that's two meters by three meters, and I want to find the flux, well, the flux is equal to B times A, and well, B is vertically in, and A is, well, flat. So B is perpendicular to A, so that's okay here. So I'll just sub in B is two, which it is, because it's two Tesla. The area, well, I don't know the area, but I can work that out pretty easily. So that's two times three, which is six square meters. So the flux would just be two times six, which is 12 weaver. So that would be the answer to this question. Usually your questions are pretty straightforward, but I can make it a more difficult one. So if an angle is involved, Now remember, you're always actually going to get the area. The area is a plane. It's just that if the plane of that is not perpendicular to the magnetic field, you can get a problem. So, well, not so much a problem, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. So let's say if you look at the sort of side view, and I'm telling you that the magnetic field is going across like this. And I don't have a rectangle that is perpendicular, but it's going like this. Okay. So this is a side view. And let's say this is at an angle of 50 degrees. Then you can probably see that if I had the same rectangle and it was vertical, versus if it was sort of slanted, you can see that not as many field lines go through, right? Because if it's vertical and the field lines are going across, more field lines go through. Four go through the black, but only three go to the, the, the blue. And if I keep turning and make it red, I can get to a point where no field line crosses the red thing. So you can basically see that the magnetic flux that goes through this coil, which is 2D, I'm just not drawing the sort of in part, it depends on the angle of the coil, right? And so really, what you really want to do is work out the amount of flux that goes through the coil. And if we take a look at this angle theta, you can see that actually depends on this vertical aspect, right? This, this length, if you call this L and we call this, um, let's say Y, we, the bigger Y is, the more lines will cut. And if we call this theta, then you can see that Y must equal L sine theta. And so you're really just getting B against this vertical line. And that's why this vertical line, and then, you know, how much it goes, like, I guess, inward, doesn't really matter, right? Like, if you think of it as 3D, that's always perpendicular to the magnetic field steel. So that's just going to then basically mean that your magnetic flux phi is going to be B 
times the area times, well, sine of theta. Your area, I guess, is going to be your, your y times your x. So it's your x times your y, which is your b times your x times your l sine theta, right? So in other words, you can think of it as b a sine theta, where a is the area of the coil. And so now that we've got that in mind, let's do this question. Let's say we've got a coil. It is again, let's say it's two meters long by five meters wide. The magnetic field is three Tesla and it is 50 degrees. Then you will simply sub in phi must equal B which is three times A, which is two times five times sine of 50. Well, that would make it 30 sine of 50 degrees, which will then make it roughly 23. And that's basically how to calculate magnetic flux, which remember is going to be imperative for our electromagnetic induction. 